Good evening and welcome to the 2021 Bhattacharya Lecture on the Future of India. I'm Raka Ray, Dean of the Social Sciences Division here at Berkeley, and I'm also Professor of Sociology and South and Southeast Asian Studies. The Bhattacharya Lecture Series is particularly close to my heart, both because of the intent of the series and because of the donors who helped create it. This is an annual series on the future of India, where thought leaders from across the spectrum of fields from politics to business, academia to civil society, and today health and medicine, share their ideas about where India is going economically, socially, politically, medically. In times of uncertainty and anxiety, such talks are especially important for they feed both our imaginations and our intellects. The Bhattacharya gift of this talk also includes a research fund for graduate students with the goal of increasing academic ties between the US and India. This year's winner is Maria Vialpando Paez for her thesis on community seed banks for sustainable rural livelihoods in Bhima Shankar Wildlife Sanctuary. Congratulations to Maria. The Bhattacharya gift came from Shankar and Kimi Bhattacharya, dear friends of Berkeley and in particular of the Institute. Early this year, with the sudden and tragic passing of Kimi, the Institute lost a dear friend and I did as well. For Shankar and Kimi were the very first philanthropists I had the privilege of working with when I was the, set, the chair of the Institute in 2003. It was always such a pleasure to be able to talk to Kimi and work with her and to be part of the warmth and affectionate energy she exuded. I miss her as do all those who had the privilege of working with her at the Institute. I am delighted to be included in helping to continue this lecture series. I will now pass things over to my colleague Shugato Ray, who is an associate professor here at Berkeley in the History of Art Department, as well as the Departments of South and Southeast Asian Studies. He's also the interim director of the Institute for South Asia Studies. Thank you for joining us, everyone, and please enjoy your time with Siddharth Mukherjee. Thank you, Raka. It, it really is a great pleasure for me to introduce our speaker for the fifth Patacharya lecture on the future of India, Dr. Siddhartha Mukherjee. Dr. Mukherjee Sid needs no introduction. We've all followed his writings with great enthusiasm over the years. Dr. Mukherjee is the author of The Emperor of All Maladies, a biography of cancer, which was the winner of the 2011 Pulitzer Prize and the Guardian First Book Award. The Emperor of Mal All Maladies was also listed in the all-time 100 non-fiction book, that is the 100 most influential books of the last century by Time Magazine in 2011. The Gene and Intimate History, listed in the New York Times 100 Best Books of 2016, is his latest work, The Story of the Quest to Decipher the Master Code of Instructions that Makes and Defines Humans that Governs Our Form, function and fate and determines the future. His essays have appeared in numerous journals, including Nature, the New England Journal of Medicine and Cell. The government of India conferred on him the fourth highest civilian award, the Padma Sri, in 2014. And he's currently an associate professor of medicine at Columbia University. Dr. Mukherjee also writes for The New Yorker and is a columnist in The New York Times. Dr. Mukherjee's talk will be followed by responses from Professors Lawrence Cohen, Aisha Mahmood, and Priya Murjani, followed by a conversation between our speaker and the three respondents. We will then open the floor to questions from the audience. Please use the, please post your questions or comments using the Q&A function at the bottom bar. Without further ado, let's jump in. Dr. Mukherjee, the stage is yours virtually. Thank you very much. Um, I'm greatly honored to give this talk. I'm going to center my um, uh, screen a little bit. And um, 
again, um, thank you to the Bhattacharyas for endowing this incredible talk. I'm a huge fan of um, the uh, of the center at Berkeley, and um, it's an honor in every way um, to be present um, at this talk. Um, very broadly speaking, I want to divide the talk up into three parts. The first part is uh, the part in which I talk about what went wrong. Um, and by what went wrong, I, meant, I mean how supply chains and um, preparedness uh, for the pandemic were disrupted in, 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 in India. Um, during the worst uh, of the pandemic. Now we are, I think, hopefully over the worst and um, prepared for the worst. Um, so that would be the first part of the talk. The second part of the talk, I want to talk about um, how we can restore these supply chains, what the um, mechanisms are by which we can restore um, faith in public health and faith in preparedness and in particular global preparedness for um, future pandemics. And in the third part of the talk, I want to talk a little bit about um, what uh, other technologies um, we are bringing to India, including some of the things that I've been doing very closely uh, to bring new cancer therapies, including CAR T therapies, uh, T cell therapies for cancer in India. So um, those are the three main sections. I will leave a lot of time for discussion and questions because I'm sure people have um, many of those in mind. Um, in the middle of the pandemic, um, I was uh, isolating in my house and I was intrigued by the question why uh, some countries like the United States were um, doing so much worse than countries that were expected to do much worse, mm -hmm. such as India, Nigeria, mm -hmm. and some other countries, Ghana, etc. cetera. Um, and there were multiple hypotheses about this. One hypothesis was, of course, it's a random event. The second hypothesis is that India has a younger population. Younger populations tend to do better with COVID. Um, and a third hypothesis was that there would be a change or a, a, a striking mutation um, in the virus that would now make the virus much more infectious and much more transmissible in India and other places. Um, unfortunately, uh, I would say the third hypothesis has rung the most true, as we have seen with the Delta variant. Um, now, all of that said, the general youth of India's population, um, just to give you a sense, you know, we have an average age of 20s to the 30s, the United States 40s to the 50s, the general youth of the, United, in the Indian population um, did actually mitigate the disastrous, the most disastrous effects even of the mutated virus. But of course the mutation itself was a, um, a, a huge problem in, in what happened in, in India. That has to do with the dynamics of the virus and with the dynamics of the population. But I want to focus a little bit on what didn't happen and what could have mitigated a lot of deaths in India, and that is supply chain. Now, the word supply chain has been used a lot. People have been, um, it's almost become jargon now, but it need, we need to understand it if we need to understand how to deal with future pandemics. Um, supply chain refers to the idea that um, goods that are required move in the right direction at the right time, at the right place, when they're, when they're needed to be moved. Um, in former economies, local economies, this was not an issue. You produced locally and you sold locally and um, 
supply chain was not an issue because you would go down to your local store and get your goods. Uh, with the specialization of particular items, um, bottled oxygen comes to mind. I'll talk a little bit more about that. The entire arena of supply chain was interrupted. In other words, the shocking thing about the pandemic in India was that there was absolutely enough oxygen, absolutely enough ventilators, absolutely enough medical supplies to be able to render this pandemic a, a, a much more mitigatable problem. But what happened is that the movement of goods from one to the other place um, did not happen in time, in place, and at the, with the urgency that was demanded. Um, we need to have, I think, in considering the future of India, we need to have a, an autopsy, as you were, if you were, if you will, um, of this supply chain concerns. Why was it that oxygen, which we produce plentifully in India, could not reach Mumbai and Delhi and other places that were desperately in need, need? And what we can do about that is a major question. And that autopsy should be taken at, should, should happen at a national level. Um, I'm involved in that process um, because I will tell you that I've, um, you know, I have a very big, um, uh, we are starting a, big, a, a major medical presence in India. And so um, that is one major question that remains, how to fix supply chain concerns in India if future pandemics or future, future disasters of whatever kind, floods, uh, droughts, et cetera, happen. Um, what we do know is that it is a fixable problem and there needs to be potentially a national committee appointed to um, rise up to the occasion very quickly if such supply chain issues arise again, which they will absolutely in our near future. Um, I had, you know, during the entire course of the pandemic, I was in very close touch with not only uh, people like Kiran Shaw um, and Adhar Punawala um, and Barkhadat reporting from the front lines of the uh, vaccination and the, um, and the uh, uh, consequences of COVID in India, but also um, in touch with my family um, who live in India and trying to find out what was broken. And it was very clear, one message that was very clear is that we as a country are totally capable of supplying our own needs in such disastrous circumstances. The problem is not capacity, the problem is capability. And the difference between those two things is very important. There is enormous capacity. There's enormous capacity for oxygen, enormous capacity for healthcare. The problem is in delivering those items, capabilities, in moving those items to the right place. Uh, I was recently uh, in the New Yorker Festival and I was interviewed uh, by Evan Osnos about the idea of globalism. And my, my one comment, which resonates here, is that utopian globalism, the utopia of globalism was that we would be exchanging the right goods at the right time in the right place. Um, that would include uh, medicines, vaccines, uh, technology, and of course, um, the goodwill very broadly speaking, between countries. Dystopian globalism is the globalism that we have inhabited in the last two years, three years. Dystopian globalism is, is the exchange 
of the wrong things at the wrong time in the wrong places. Viruses, um, the, the, the deportation of immigrants, um, the uh, inappropriate uh, use of, uh, of uh, elements that affect climate and the inappropriate use of political and uh, uh, local misinformation. So in other words, we took something that was a, that, that was a fantastically beautiful idea from the 1950s and 60s of globalism, of a globalized economy and a utopian globalized economy and converted it into a dystopian globalized, globalized economy in which we are trading not the right things but the wrong things. We're trading infections, we're trading immigrants and sending them back. We are trading uh, uh, the worst of uh, climate change problems and we are trading, uh, I would say, a dystopian form of diplomacy rather than a utopian form of diplomacy. Which now brings me to the second point. Um, how could we fix this? Um, there have been efforts across the globe, but especially um, among major countries that represent major populations. The bizarre thing about these efforts is that Everyone agrees, there is no disagreement about the fact that we need to um, make vaccines accessible, that we need to vaccinate populations, and we need to stop exchanging these, um, what I would call dystopian global uh, goods, the viruses among them, but dystopian global goods. When the G7 meeting happened, um, we were informed that everyone was in total agreement that these uh, things need to be addressed, but nothing was done about it. When the G20 meeting happened, similar, everyone is, was in total agreement. No one disagrees with the phenomenon, but there seems to be a lack of action. Um, one of the things that I imagine for the future of India as we move into a new century is that India needs to be a leader in this space. Not because we are the richest, not because we are the wisest, but our population and our democracy demand that we um, create a space in which um, like other countries of our size and diversity, um, and many come to mind, Brazil comes to mind, um, of course the United States comes to mind, um, that we create a, a, um, a mechanism by which global preparedness is, is a centerpiece of the, uh, of, of the next century. Um, and by preparedness, I mean preparedness for everything, not just for viruses, but for the potentials of climate change, the potentials for um, uh, various um, economies that are, in, that are fragile and have been rendered fragile, and the potential for growth and technology as we move forward into the new century. Um, I have spoken several times with um, people both private philanthropists and with um, governmental organizations to create a what I would call a preparedness council. That preparedness council would, cre uh, would create a master list of concerns that affect not just India, but the planet, but of course India is very much part of it because of the size of its population and the power of its population the, and the youth of its population um, and address them in, in a systematic manner. Um, we do not have a, what I would call, not the World Health Organization, the WHO, but the WPO, the World Preparedness Organization. And we need one. 
um, and whether we call it WPO, a global preparedness organization, et cetera, it needs to have the highest degree of representation from countries that require preparedness and that want to participate in preparedness. And once again, I would hold a friendly hand out to the one country that has resisted such preparedness, that would be China, and say, um, this is a, we are becoming so global that in the absence of preparedness, that we will um, suffer greatly and deeply if we don't have such a world preparedness um, institution, um, much akin to, as I said, the WP, WHO or other institutions. In the last five to 10 minutes, I'd like to talk a little bit about technologies that are outside COVID that we and others are bringing to India and what we can do and have been able to do. Um, just uh, last week, um, we, and by we, I mean a consortium of physicians and scientists uh, have opened a institution to deliver T-cell therapies, which are cutting edge cancer therapies to India. This was inspected by the Drug Controller General and is continuing inspections as we speak. We hope to be able to deliver these therapies, so-called CAR-T therapies, to Indian patients, especially Indian children, in uh, the first quarter of 2022. Um, we also expect to hope uh, to deliver these therapies at one tenth or one twentieth the cost that um, that they are in the United States. So, a typical course of CAR T therapy costs about four hundred fifty thousand dollars in the United States, unimaginable for any person in, in in India. We hope to bring that down to about twenty thousand um, dollars by using the best of our engineering and the best of our um, uh, scientific capabilities. Um, the company is called Immuneal. It's a collaboration with Biocon, but it's been highly supported by the government. And we are not the only ones, there are several others, but we, we will be the first in Asia outside China to deliver CAR-T therapies to patients in India. Um, I want to particularly focus on this because I have been endlessly impressed. Um, I started Immuneal with Kiran Shaw and with um, uh, Kush Parmar, with help from several uh, investors in India about two years ago. And in two years, even through COVID, we built the facility to deliver T cell therapies um, to patients in India. Um, I've written about this in the United States. It took 20 years to do this in the United States because of obviously the te te technology had to be delivered and, and developed in the United States. But we, I have been extraordinarily impressed by the speed and the alacrity with which we responded to this in India. I have also been extraordinarily impressed by the speed and the alacrity by which we developed vaccines in India. We have a paper out on this, uh, on the AstraZeneca vaccine, which is major or primarily produced in India uh, through the Serum Institute. Um, and I continue to be impressed by the level of energy and technological prowess that has, uh, that has appeared over the last 10 to 20 years in, in India, not only in the technological sector that you're familiar with, computer sciences and others, but also in biological sciences, biotech and so forth. And one of the major concerns remains how that gets translated into, into um, the preparedness and health of the country. 
Um, right now, one of the crises that I think that exacerbated the COVID crisis in India was that there was there is fundamentally no central system, central federal system by which to deliver care to patients in India. We lack a central federal, um, I would call a nationalized system by which people who have um, little access to resources can have access to care. Um, and so the two major, the three major, sorry, um, things that I would um, call for as we end this lecture is number one, to create and um, have a supply chain um, institution within India that, in, that guarantees that the lack of oxygen or the lack of ventilators or the lack of masks and preparedness does not occur again. This is a very simple problem to solve. We, the country produces enough oxygen to solve the problem. It just happens to be produced in one place and not delivered to the other place. So task one is to create a task force such that these supply chain issues are solved for not just the next year, but forever. And whether this is the Ministry of Interior's problem, whether this becomes a, a, a um, non-governmental um, issue is a question that I would leave open to the, uh, the powers that be, but we need such a, such a task force. Number two, is a task for force on preparedness. What do we need to prepare for? How do we pre prepare for it? Um, this is an, a, an international conversation, not a national conversation. And India has a giant stake in it given the size of its population, the youth of its population and its capacity for technology. And number three, um, what are the technological capabilities that we have and how can we deliver these technological capabilities through a nationalized healthcare system which can be accessed by more people than it has been accessed by today. So really, if I were to say those are the highest priorities for India as we move forward and the future of India really depends on the creation of these, what I would call the three task forces. Um, I have authored an article on this, um, the three task forces. Um, I have sent it to the, uh, to the government and I would be happy to serve pro bono in any manner possible in the creation of these three task forces, um, which again, will allow India to enter a new century. Just to remind ourselves again, supply chain, preparedness, and a national health program uh, endowed by technology. Um, I will now stop, it's 8.30, I will stop now and open the discussion to um, the entire audience and to the discussants. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Mukherjee, for really this fascinating, bring up this very important set of questions and thoughts as, as we segue into the next segment of the Patacharya Lecture on the Future of India. Let me invite, again virtually, our respondents. Mm -hmm. Lawrence Cohen is Professor in Anthropology and South and Southeast Asian mm -hmm. Studies and the Co-Director of the Medical Anthropology Program. Aisha Mahmood is an assistant professor in the Department of Demography. Her research focuses on the interplay between human population change, environmental factors, and infectious disease dynamics. Our third respondent, Priya Murjani, is assistant professor in the Department of Molecular and Cell Biology. Her research focuses on using statistical and computational 
approaches to study questions in human genetics and evolutionary biology. Let me also remind our audience that we will open up the floor to questions after a conversation between Sid, Lawrence, Ayesha, and Priya. Please post your questions or comments using the Q&A function. Lawrence, the stage is yours. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, throughout the pandemic, Dr. Mukherjee has offered a broad global readership wise counsel, and it's an honor to listen to him at, at Berkeley as the fifth Bhattacharya lecturer. It may be gratuitous to say, but he is such a brilliant polymath that listening to all that he does in the CAR T's therapy initiative is potentially extraordinary, takes one's breath away, but I shall persevere. One of his many essays on the pandemic that I keep returning to was a piece in the New Yorker that he alluded to today, where Dr. Mukherjee thinks with what over the first year of the pandemic pre-Delta had become what he calls an epidemiological conundrum. Why that is at the time in many poor and middle tier economies and particularly in South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa, did the prevalence of coronavirus disease despite the inability to create social distancing in households and in dense urban slums appear to be significantly lower than in Western Europe or at his own hospital in New York. In hindsight, one could of course argue and came back to this today, that the questions that the experience of COVID in India provokes have changed so radically. And today's talk, of course, takes the devastation of the pandemic's Delta wave as central to its rigorous speculation on public health preparedness. I wrote this comments over breakfast this morning, my laptop sitting next to a newspaper announcing the first US identification of the Omicron variant this week in San Francisco. But let me begin with this earlier essay, as I think its lessons for us should not be lost. And in closing, turn to one or two brief questions provoked by the talk today. In his New Yorker essay, Dr. Mukherjee begins by noting that a new variant might well overturn what was then a relatively felicitous picture in India, as indeed it did. And yet the question he asked remains relevant. Why was India, why was Bangladesh, why was Ghana and Nigeria to take four of the countries he considers spared for so relatively long? His essay considers multiple reasons for this lower or apparently lower prevalence of serious disease. Is it, Dr. Mukherjee first asks, a matter of the structure of habitation? That is, how we live together as families. As he puts it with careful precision, quote, are the risks greater for a younger country with a larger family size, but with infrequent social contacts, or for an older country with a smaller family size, but frequent contacts, unquote. In other words, might the extended intergenerational or joint family play a protective role? Or, Dr. Mukherjee then goes on to ask, is this a matter of the underreporting of illness, whether because governments may wish to obscure politically unpopular news, because persons may want to minimize the often devastating stigma of being known to be COVID positive, or because of the absence of a public health apparatus to count cases effectively? One way around the case rate he notes has been to count the bodies, that is to count reported death rates. In India, over the first year of pandemic death, uh, uh, pandemic death rates do increase significantly, if not in a pattern skewed towards male deaths that reflects the epidemiology of coronavirus mortality globally. Could these deaths, Dr. Mukherjee asks, be due to the secondary effects of the economic costs of pandemic governance, the disappearance of livelihood and the rise in malnutrition and lack of access to basic medical care, even before the profound disruption of um, supply chains. A third of the many responses to the conundrum that Dr. Mukherjee considers is the prior uh, um, immunity hypothesis, whether um, it, that is some immunological uh, tools, um, sorry, whether that is some immunological tools at the center level for resisting COVID-19 infection may be more present among some populations, say amongst elderly persons in India, given prior exposure to pathogens bearing some family resemblance to the pandemic coronaviruses. In the end, Dr. Mukherjee reminds us of the solution to the mystery in Agatha Christie's Murder on the Orient Express. And I warn you, there's a spoiler ahead. That is, there may not be one culprit, but many. Indeed, that all of these suspected reasons for the differential impact of coronavirus infection in South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa before Delta may have played a part. What of the current moment when the questions have necessarily shifted? 
The medical anthropologist Andrew Lakoff offers us a helpful distinction. Lakoff reminds us that a new regime organizing the governments of public health globally emerges in the last decades of the 20th century, one organized around preparedness, and that this new form of public health, because people did not conceive in the same way of preparedness, let alone to have a council for it, um, well until the, the end of the 20th century. And this new form, he argues, is different than the form he terms infectious disease prevention, which emerges over the mid to late 19th century, and that, of course, is still with us. Preparedness focuses on future events, on disease outbreaks that have not yet occurred and may never occur, and it depends on techniques that assess the uncertain form of future events. We may think, for example, of the Cold War modeling of future nuclear attacks using emerging computer technologies to prepare for possible catastrophe. Prevention, on the other hand, suggests Lakoff, has depended on technologies that map and suggest patterns from historical and spatial data, what he terms the regularities of populations in the past. In the case of the COVID pandemic two years on, one might argue that what is needed, and again, Dr. Mukherjee's use of murder on the Orient Express comes to mind, are forms of pandemic governance that combine the historic data of the past two years, that is a prevention regime, with practices orienting to oriented to uncertain futures, for example, to the uncertainty of the Omicron variant. So one question that I might have is to what extent, if any, is the earlier pre-Delta variant picture in India, the epidemiological conundrum that Dr. Mukherjee outlined so persuasively, relevant to how one thinks about prevention, preparedness, policy, and care over the coming years, in addition to countering the specter of what Dr. Mukherjee today terms dystopian globalism. And my second and final question for now to Dr. Mukherjee, Several of the features of this dystopian globalism appear now as cherished policy objectives of the Indian government and indeed of many governments around the world. The deportation of migrants most notably, but also the use of elements that destroy climate. To what extent can the autopsy you rightly call for take as realistic the vision of utopian globalism you outline? And let me pass the baton on to Dr. Mahmoud. Thank you, Dr. Cohen, and thank you so much um, to the organizers and, and to Dr. Mukherjee for that. Really, really, I think, you know, thought provoking is, is, is the word that comes to mind um, because you so clearly um, outline sort of some of the, you know, the, the challenges that, that remain and, and sort of the, the path forward for addressing those challenges. So I'm gonna keep my comments fairly brief um, and I want to touch on a few things that, that you mentioned in your talks and some of which is very close to my heart in terms of things I think about. Um, so, so you had um, in your talk, Dr. Mukherjee very nicely sort of laid out um, thinking about what went wrong with the supply chain issue and, and, I, and, and doing sort of an, going back and doing an autopsy of, of, of what went wrong as, as a way to learn and move forward. And I, and, I, and I think touching on also what Dr. Cohen talked about, maybe thinking also about an autopsy of, of the Delta outbreak and, and, and what, you know, sort of taking stock of, of what happened in India in terms of um, infection rates and mortality and, and transmission dynamics. And I think there's a few interesting things that, that research has um, sort of revealed, but, but, but I think there's a lot more work to be done. One is that I think I've been involved in a few different studies looking at mortality um, due to COVID-19 in India. And one of the things is that, it, you know, partly because there's perhaps no nationally federal central public health database system, you know, sort of even studying these questions has been challenging. And so sort of one of your task force ideas is to sort of set up this sort of um, task force that will think about this national um, federated system. But I think one of the issues that we that, that would need to address is sort of, you know, how do you, how do you collect these kinds of data and how do you make these available to people who, who need to study them? So why is it so hard, for example, to count excess mortality in India? You know, there's been a few studies published now, but, um, a lot of it has been reporters doing investigative journalism and, and filing Freedom of Information Act. So I think one of the pathways forward to me seems to be working on sort of strengthening the system for collecting some of this, this very uh, basic uh, public health measures. I think the, the other sort of interesting um, 
results that have come out of these mortality studies in India is, is thinking about sort of, you mentioned this, this the youth and the, the young population of India sort of mitigated um, some of the worst effects of the pandemic because we know mortality effects are so much worse um, for the in, uh, elderly um, from COVID-19. But some of the studies from India suggest that, that you know, 40 or 50 year olds were dying at particularly men at much higher rates. A lot of it we think due to comorbidities. But again, I think there's a lot to sort of unpack there and, and think about. Um, and, and I think this all comes down to sort of having basic surveillance systems and basic healthcare systems, which you um, mentioned, and this, this idea of, of um, you know, getting care to those who, who, who don't, might not have the resources and thinking about this in a sort of centralized, nationalized federal system that, that that provides care, but also collects the information that then is available um, to public health researchers in, the, in, in India um, who, who are, you know, would be able to take quick decisions um, based on that data. I think the, the, the sort of um, second point that I thought was really interesting is thinking about this sort of global preparedness um, um, task force or, or WPO, um, as, as you mentioned. And, and one of the sort of areas of uh, research that I focus on is thinking about climate change and, and the impact climate change will have on, on not just the future of India, but, you know, I'm from Bangladesh, so, you know, this is something that weighs heavily on me, um, but South Asia and, 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 and globally. And, you know, I, I think the, the question sort of I would pose to you is sort of what role do you think that we, because we're sort of in an academic setting here, what role do you think we as academics have in, in sort of helping think through this preparedness plan? So, um, you know, just as an example, I, I've worked very closely, particularly with direct relief and in, in responding to um, sort of cholera outbreaks after um, hurricanes or, um, you know, outbreaks in refugee camps and, and, and so forth. And a lot of times those are um, you know, academics in some ways swoop in as, you know, and, and, and you know, respond to an effort. And then um, maybe there's a task force to oversee this, but a lot of it is sort of one of efforts. And, and, and it seems to me that academics have a role to play here. And, and so one of my questions to, be, to you would be to think about if we had such a WPO or even a task force at a national level uh, for preparedness, what role do we have in, in sort of, um, you know, helping uh, countries think about preparedness from either climate change or um, other kinds of pandemic. And then I think the the, the last point is I think um, India is so um, uniquely suited to in some ways take take the lead in this because there is such a strong um, capacity and capability and on the ground in India to do this kind of work and this kind of research. There's incredible amount of work already happening. I think some of the barriers is just basic disease surveillance, um, basic availability of public health data. But I think India has the capacity and the, and the, and the training of physicians and, and researchers to do some of these things that you, that you outlined. So I think um, sort of thinking through how to, how to sort of harness the, the capacity that India already has um, to become a leader in preparedness, I think is, is the sort of real, real challenge. So. Thank you, and I'll, I'll pass it over to Dr. Morjani. Um, thank you very much for this very, um, very thoughtful and timely discussion, Dr. Mukherjee. Uh, this has, uh, it's been really uh, interesting to follow the COVID pandemic across the world, and in particular in India, where in the first wave, India did really well, and there were questions all over the world about what was differentiating uh, South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa, and you wrote extensively on this, and it was very uh, thought-provoking. Uh, as a geneticist, I got asked a lot by uh, folks here at Berkeley and elsewhere about what were some of the reasons why India could be doing. Did we have genetic mutations that predisposed us to potentially be better prepared for infectious diseases? Uh, given a history of uh, infectious diseases in the country. Um, and no matter where we looked in the genome, we didn't find the answer there. If anything, we found variants that uh, had uh, intergressed through Neanderthal gene flow, but were deleterious for Indians and were present at high frequency. So there was this puzzle that we kept seeing. First, there was very limited evidence that host genetics mattered, but even when it did appear it mattered, it was in the other direction. 
Uh, and so um, in some ways, when the Delta variant hit, it was again surprising in the reverse direction where India just seemed not at all prepared. Uh, and uh, all the things that you've outlined today are uh, really very important um, sources of investment for the country. Um, and it's something that, um, as uh, Dr. Mahmood mentioned, it's something that many of us academics uh, thought at the time during the pandemic and also uh, continue to think about how can we as academics uh, and also many people who uh, uh, are diaspora from India uh, have been thinking about how can we help and how what should uh, what role can we play to um, help in uh, the preparedness for future pandemics. Um, as a geneticist, I um, also think a lot about how can we make sure that technologies that are available here in the United States are also similarly available in India. Uh, in your gene book, uh, which is a beautiful uh, piece of literature, and it uh, has made many complicated topics about genetics and the advances in genetics accessible to a wide audience, um, has uh, really uh, shown people around the world how much power there is in genetics. But one thing that is um, also true is that the benefit of genetics today is very disproportionate across the world. Majority of the genetic studies have been performed in uh, people of European descent. And we know a lot about the genetics of Europeans, including the genetics of complex diseases. Whereas this benefit has not uh, reached South Asians as much. And South Asians have a very complex uh, population history. Uh, and we are learning that variants that are identified in uh, some populations are not always transferable to other populations. So variants identified in Europeans don't always explain the genetics or disease prevalence in other groups, uh, largely because these other groups have different population histories. So Indians um, have uh, ancestry from uh, a group that is only present in South Asia. Uh, we have come to refer to it as the ancestral South Indian group, and they have ancestry from uh, a West Eurasian populations, Central Asians, um, and uh, Iranian populations, uh, and there the genetics are more overlapping. So what we learn from Europeans in that case would be informative for some proportion of Indians, uh, but there uh, there are also very strong uh, uh, severe founder events in South Asian populations, such that each group in India is actually a very unique population and is, has its own unique history and ancestry. Um, and so it's timely for uh, India to uh, also invest in research uh, and to take advantage of these new technologies to learn about um, uh, to learn about our genetic makeup to try to see how we can um, leverage the, this information for reducing disease bur burden. And so I was very excited to hear about your efforts related to the CAR-T technology uh, and bringing that to India uh, in this uh, global preparedness, um, uh, preparedness um, uh, efforts. It's also very important for India to um, uh, try to think of increasing its uh, investment in research. So currently, India invests 0.7% of its uh, GDP on research. Um, and this is uh, five times less than what US does, about 3%. And even China now invests about 2.5% in its uh, of its GDP in research. Um, and so trying to um, also increase the uh, efforts in increasing the investment in research um, can also help us be better prepared to make sure that uh, the new technologies benefit not just uh, people in some countries, but also globally benefit uh, all of us to reduce disease burden and make uh, treatments accessible everywhere. Um, and uh, Finally, I would be remiss if I don't ask you this. Uh, I saw yesterday on Twitter that you just finished the last word of your new book. Uh, and so I'm sure like me, everybody's dying to hear more about this book. So if you can tell us a little bit about that, we would love to hear more. Okay. Um, 
uh, Shugoto is is the floor mine, or do you want to intervene? And no, please. I mean, I, our next segment is a conversation between you, Dr. Makuchi, and our three respondents. So the floor is yours. So let me take um, some of these points. I'm, I'm not going to address each of the individual questions, but try to synthesize um, what the questions are getting to. Um, I think, as I said, I made three major points in, the, uh, in, my, in my lecture. Point number one is that we need a global preparedness organization. Um, and I'll come back to that in a second. Number two is we need a local, and by local, I mean India specific supply chain um, task force. And number three, we need to reassess our national, in India, our national healthcare system and our national technological capabilities to figure out where, where we are positioned in the new century. Those were the three central points of the, of the talk. Now, um, let me talk through those one after the other because they have all been brought up in the three respondents' questions. Um, I think India is uniquely positioned to be not just a participant, but a leader in a preparedness effort. We are a democracy. We have open systems of information. We can create open systems of information. Our press is free. Our uh, capacity, as, uh, as Dr. Mahmood pointed out, is, is enormous. Um, the work that's been done by journalists during the pandemic, and as Dr. Cohen pointed out, by individuals in the pandemic, should have been done by a task force. In other words, let's ask a simple question. What was the curve of excess mortality during January 2020 through, um, let's say, June or July 2021? And to what extent is that excess mortality age specific and to what extent is that COVID related? Okay, these are data questions. These data questions are solvable because they are entirely related to pieces of data. They're entirely related to um, things that can be assessed objectively. There's no subjective component to this. How much of this is because of wage loss, job loss, migration, forced migration, as opposed to um, deaths due to an infectious disease that they don't, that people don't have access to healthcare, right? This is the data and, and a demographic question. These are being now solved by a group of people who are actually, to be totally honest, untrained to solve these questions. They have been trained by journalism, they've been trained by various other metrics, but a task force of people who have been trained in demographics and public health could solve this question because they have the, they're armed with the tools to solve this question. So, um, Given the size of the Indian population, given the centrality of Indian migration, immigration, and, um, and I would say, frankly, importance in global politics, it seems to be that, it seems to me that India could very well be the leader of a global preparedness organization. I would nominate other countries to this. 
um, and I've already spoken about them, Brazil, several Latin American countries, several Asian countries, uh, Indonesia, Malaysia come to mind given the sizes of their populations. Bangladesh comes to mind given it's again the size of its population. Pakistan comes to mind, given the size of its population. I mean, obviously, the the, the question that I often ask uh, my students is, um, and you will be amazed at the answers. I, I ask them to list the world's most ten populous countries, um, and just list them by approximate number. And you will be amazed by how many people are unable to list the world's most populous countries, period. Um, and you will be amazed at how many of those countries lie in Asia or border Asia. Um, go, I mean, I, I'm not gonna ask you to do this right now, but go through it in your own minds. Um, try to list the, the world's 10 most populous countries and try to figure out how many of them are in Asia or border Asia. And you will be, I would suspect, if you are not a, a, a demographer like Dr. Mahmoud, you would be surprised by what you, what you think is correct and what you know is correct. Um, once you've done that exercise, you will quickly realize why India, aside from China, why India should be a leader in this effort, because we have the benefits of uh, technological uh, prowess, as well as a free press, as well as the capacity to disseminate that information across many countries. And a coalition, particularly of India, Bangladesh and Pakistan, neighboring countries, would be especially important because that coalition would uh, not just cover, and this might come as a surprise to you, that would cover approximately one third to one half of the entire planet's population. Let me repeat that. A coalition of India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and if you throw in Indonesia, that would be a, uh, and another uh, bonus. China aside, because the, the system there is closed. A coalition of Indonesia, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh. If you want to throw in Brazil, just for international context, you can throw in Brazil for international context. That would cover this is not a joke, an entire one third to one half of the entire population of the planet. If such a global preparedness organization could then mount a surveillance system for various diseases, various threats, climate change inclusive, that would be a an enormous benefit to everyone. And I would argue that that would be a benefit to populations such as the United States, the Middle East, et cetera, et cetera, where there are fewer people, but who suffer the possibilities of infectious diseases and the consequences of global change entering their borders and disrupt and having primary dis disruptions of the economy. So the conclusion here is that India is extraordinarily well positioned and a coalition between India, India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Indonesia, Brazil is extraordinarily well positioned to take a global leadership role in preparedness. And if we want representation from a, a, a country in the continent of Africa, of course, it would be either Nigeria or South Africa, both of which would be, again, benefits uh, to the system. So we would have Latin America, South Asia, South Asia particularly, and um, 
and the continent of Africa represented. And again, the idea of global preparedness would be extraordinarily important. I cannot emphasize that this global preparedness crosses multiple themes, including climate change, migration, immigration, and of course, infectious diseases and other diseases that are moving through these populations. Um, it would be a wonderful thing if China participated in this. That would bring us really to half the global population. But of course, China has its own concerns and problems, which, uh, which we can talk about later. So that is point number one, it, that a global preparedness organization, uh, what I call the WPO, is a, an important necessity of the times. The, and I, I suspect that it responds to both Dr. Cohen and Dr. Mahmoud's questions about what we need to do about the next um, era of preparedness. The second set of questions, uh, broadly speaking, are about, um, as I said, supply chain concerns in India and in Asia in general. Um, we have witnessed an acute disruption, not only within the United States, but within all countries of, of supply chains. Um, the word supply chain, the phrase supply chain, was not even in our vocabularies before uh, COVID hit. And so I think a, an, import, an incredibly important piece of this is to figure out how to address the supply chain concerns and how to solve what Dr. Cohen uh, um, referred to as some of the enigmas of why and how countries did or performed during the pandemic. Some of it was clearly age. We are younger countries. We are countries where, um, you know, the general population was younger. But on the other hand, there were also deep comorbidities, um, diabetes, asthma, res respiratory illnesses, etc. But what we didn't talk about is that, despite that despite those deep comorbidities and the, and the relative youth of the population, there were people in Delhi, Mumbai, Chandigarh, and other places that were begging for oxygen. And, the, and we, 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 India produces enough oxygen to supply its entire population. It's just that it produces it in East India, whereas the hit of the pandemic and the great population lived in Northern and mostly Northern India. So um, locally speaking, and this applies to all the countries that I referred to, there, I think a task force to deploy supply chain concerns and issues would be absolutely essential. And that task force should report out to the public, to journalists, and to broadly speaking, everyone, so that we understand what the supply chain issues are and how we can solve them. Trains run on time in India. They can bring oxygen from Odisha to Chandigarh. Why they didn't bring oxygen from Odisha to Chandigarh is a question. And that's an, that's an autopsy question. Um, we need to find out the answer to that question. Is it because the healthcare system was privatized and therefore the supply demand was inappropriate? Is it because there was no task force, there was no commanding force? We don't know the answers. An autopsy would be helpful. Every time we fail a biological or ecological experiment, we need, we need an autopsy. 
those autopsies in free countries, in free democracies, are extraordinarily helpful because they go to the journalists, the journalists then turn them around and pressurize the government to perform the appropriate uh, tasks that are required uh, from an autopsy. Finally, let me turn to um, the very important comment, comments by Dr. Mujani. Um, supply chain and uh, preparedness aside, uh, we learned that um, variants of the virus could swipe aside whatever prior immunity that India or other countries had so that the mortalities now began to reflect the real mortalities that would be expected in an age-structured population like India. Um, and so the only way to prevent that, as far as I know, are, is vaccination. And, um, and despite all the anti-vaxxer communities in the various parts of the world, there is only one way to prevent that and that's vaccination because um, it, the efforts at, at containment and at contact tracing have had marginal, have had impact, but have had marginal impact on populations in general, especially very mobile populations like we have in India. So the, um, the question then becomes, how do we, and it's an important question, how do we vaccinate people in a timely and a time specific manner? And when new strains emerge, how do we assess the effects of vaccination? The next 10 days, I would say, are among the most crucial days for um, what happens across globally. Because we need to find out and we publish, we as in my group has published this on the Delta strain, we need to find out whether the extent to which the prior vaccines, which were against the original uh, 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 strains of uh, COVID or SARS-CoV-2 are effective with boosters against the newer strains that are, that are emerging. We know now, we, we do know that for Delta, we need to find that out for Omicron. That data is extraordinarily crucial because it will dictate whether we need to make a new vaccine or whether the vaccinated population in India and other places, uh, most of which is uh, AstraZeneca and Johnson & Johnson, um, will be relatively protected from the worst effects of Omicron. So um, we have a huge task in front of us, but we have data missing and that data needs to be made public as soon as possible. We are following, I am following on a day-to-day -day basis what that data looks like. We still don't have it. There are, it's anecdotal and the anecdotal evidence in a hopeful world suggests that it's not very bad, but it's all anecdotal. Um, so we are in a limbo, I would say, until we know the case fatality rate among various age groups of Omicron. Um, I can give you my personal view on it. My personal view on it is that vaccinated individuals and potentially vaccinated and boosted individuals will likely have mild infections uh, with Omicron, but I cannot tell you that with certainty because I don't have the data. Um, and then I'll come to the fun part of the last question, which is what is my new book about? My new book is A History of Cell Biology. Uh, starting from uh, 
uh, Leeuwenhoek and Robert Hooke's first observations uh, under the microscope. Um, there is a lot of uh, Indian history there because of course vaccination or tika as we say uh, is an Indo-Chinese phenomenon uh, is I would say one of the first examples of cell therapy and it goes all the way to CAR T cells and of course to our new efforts in bringing CAR T cells to India as one of the first examples of how Indian technology can be, uh, have a lot of prowess in this area. So I won't, I won't be, give you a spoilers, but I will tell you that it's, uh, uh, um, the book is about the cell and it's part of a trilogy, a cancer, the gene, the cell. Thank you, Dr. Mukherjee, and we're greatly looking forward to reading more once the book is out. But I wonder if our- I'll put out a little, little, um, I'll put out little uh, things on, on Twitter if you um, want to follow them, but I'll put out little teasers as we go along. We, we have, it's a long process because the, you know, when I write a book, there are six, four, 500 pages and they are read by um, about a hundred odd readers. Um, so it takes time. So I beg your patience, uh, but it will come out. Uh, to, our, to our respondents, have any other follow-up comments, questions, thoughts? I, I mean, uh, Lawrence, do you have something? Just... Well, it's just, uh, I'm very intrigued by the, the world planning, um, uh, Council, as it were, it, 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 you know, science fiction accounts of the future, often um, some centuries in the future, um, there's, you could argue, two versions. In one version, the countries of the Westphalian world, the world of nation states, come together, um, whether it's Starfleet or some version, um, and they, they, they produce something that, that, that deals with um, emergent challenges with the question of preparedness. And in the other version, they don't come together and well, it's a bad end. But it's, it's, it's um, and, I, and I, and you may be right that, that unless one thinks with some rigor and some hope about the possibility of what structure would bring people together, then, then we can't even begin to get anywhere. So I'm, I'm committed to that. The, the question I have is the gap. I mean, if I focus on environmental action and the recent global meetings, there is often a gap between the expertise that might come together with such a council and the complexities of how localized, you know, nation by nation and politics operate. Uh, and that's even without the, the current, you know, uh, climate of the last few years, which is in some cases very anti-science. So it's, it's, it's um, so I'm just wrestling with how does one manage that gap? Well, I think, I think that, that one, one, I think, uh, I mean, there's good news and bad news as it were. The, the, the bad news is that we have woken up to the fact, both through climate change and through COVID. And there's a theme that runs through both of them, right? The theme that, and immigration, I would say, would be the third theme. The theme that runs through all of these is that previously um, solipsistic nations, the United States being the primary among them, you know, our, our land is an island. The UK was this in. The 19, in the 1800s. Um, we can think of France and Netherlands like this in the early 17th and 18th century. Our land is an island, right? We import slaves, um, but that's just an import. We set them to work in plantations and so forth. And then all of a sudden in the 20th century and in the 21st century, we, we, 
wake up as if from a bad dream and realize that our lands are not islands, that the importation of slaves was not a, a, a phenomenon that you can push off or relegate into history, that the deportation of immigrants is not a phenomenon that you can push off into history. As, uh, as Dr. Murjani pointed out, genetics is more complicated than you imagine. There is no pure genetic populations. There are no pure genetic populations. Um, that climate is global climate, that if it floods in Bangladesh, it, it will also probably flood in the Hudson. And so the, what I would call the ecology, the social ecology and the um, planetary ecology of humans, the social ecology of climates, the planetary ecology of humans, we are reassessing now. Thank God, because it is high time to reassess them. Um, the, when the Brahmaputra floods, it means something about what might happen to New Orleans. Who would have thunked, as it were, right? But it does mean something. Um, when the, when the um, glaciers of the Antarctic melt, it means something not only to the delta in Bangladesh or Indonesia or to the Seychelles or Mauritius, it means something to the Netherlands or it means something to as I said, New Orleans or Louisiana, we are all connected. Um, it is an astonishment of human history that it took us three centuries to figure this out. But we have, I think, I hope that the pandemic, climate change and immigration, the three big um, moments that have arrived in our times has shown us all of these things. Genetics is complicated, climate change is complicated, disease surveillance is complicated, and um, migration and immigration are complicated. And the only way to get out of this is not to bury your head in the sand like an ostrich, but to confront these issues as they move along. Now, the question becomes who should confront these issues? Wealthy nations are both the, I would say the, um, they, they, they in principle could lead the issues, but it's the problem, the, the problem arises as a confluence of the so-called wealthy nations of the West and emerging nations of the East and of the South. And to not call them to the table is to, to make a massive mistake. And that is why I, I keep saying that India is in an ideal position, sort of in the middle of all of these, technologically adept, free press, or sort of free, 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 free press, um, genetically diverse, climatically diverse, geographically diverse, to lead the effort. And so I have written several times, and I will keep, keep writing again privately, but perhaps more publicly, to say that, you know, um, a coalition from Asia involving the African sub, uh, involving the African con continent, involving major powers in Europe, and involving, of course, large countries in Latin America, 
are really poised to lead a global preparedness, um, a global preparedness uh, effort. Now, you could ask me who should fund this effort. Well, you know, the loss of um, income from climate change alone is estimated over the next years to be several trillion dollars, not billion dollars, but several trillion dollars. This is because of displacement. This is because of migration. This is because of loss of land and so forth. A global preparedness organization funded by on the orders of several billion dollars, that's three zeros away from several trillion dollars, is a totally acceptable and a totally realizable goal. Um, it could, it would be, a, it would liaise with the WHO, it would liaise with global climate change organizations, of course, it would liaise with Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance, and so forth. But the crucial feature of this is to have participation. You cannot, you cannot be China and say, I'm sorry, I'm not going to participate. And, and over and over again, we've seen this, that countries do want to participate. Other countries need to be persuaded to particip participate, and yet other countries need to be forced to participate. And the only thing that will work is a combination of a carrot and a stick so that we have a global preparedness system. Aisha, Priya, any comments? Uh, Dr. Mukherjee, really looking forward to your new book. Um, so I would, I think I can say for all the other people too, we would really appreciate those teasers. So I'll send you teasers. Coming. <laughs> uh, but going back to this question of the global preparedness uh, uh, efforts, um, it, uh, it, in some ways, it seems like a very obvious thing to do. The pandemic has really made it very obvious that we need to work together, we need to be prepared. And given that there are new variants all the time, we know that this pandemic and maybe many other pandemics like this are not going to, this is not going to be the last one. That's right. So, but one challenge of course is who should lead this and not just a country, but uh, what group of individuals should lead this? Should this be at a national level led by one country? Or should this be led by individuals like Doctors Without Borders or by an NGO? Uh, what are some of the political challenges to bring everybody at the table? Um, you did mention that the funding is a small amount, uh, especially compared to the cost that uh, disasters like the pandemic or climate change will bring. But uh, still, who would be the fund? Who would be the funders of such an effort? Um, and as I was thinking about this, one thing that came to mind, something that I learned also from your book was the history of March of Dimes, yeah. uh, where it was an effort that uh, really got everybody involved. Uh, and everybody knew that, you know, we all are equally at risk. And possibly we all need to come together and try to solve this problem by funding uh, research in uh, different topics. Could something like that be imp uh, implemented at a global scale? Uh, what are some of the other ideas and challenges you think would work better? You know, I have a utopian vision of all of this, and it could be completely uh, false. And But my utopian vision is, as I said, um, people always forget. I mean, I often remind my students there are three zeros between trillion and billion and three zeros between billion and million. Um, because once you get to the millions, people forget what the numbers mean. Yeah. Um, 
funding a, an international effort uh, for global preparedness against threats. And you can list them in various orders. We've talked about the major ones. I would say the major ones are climate change, migration, pandemics, right? So a global preparedness organization that could handle at least those three major concerns would be uh, of great importance. The participant nations should be nations that are of significance in this. India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Indonesia, Brazil. We could talk about Latin American countries, Nigeria, South, South Africa, and others. Um, and um, the funding could easily come from an offshoot of the World Health Organization or others. Um, but what, what, but I keep reminding people, we lost several trillion dollars in the pandemic, several trillion dollars of economy. People are still struggling. There's an article in the New York Times today. Yeah. People are still struggling to get their livelihoods off the ground. Not only in the United States, in India, in Indonesia, in Bangladesh, in Pakistan, everywhere around the world. Had we been better prepared to, for instance, distribute vaccines, make vaccines and make vaccines, it, let, let me be clear, it was an extraordinary effort. And I'm proud to, be ha to have contributed to that effort. We sent serum to the Serum Institute. Um, we, uh, as a group, um, opened up several doors to make uh, the AstraZeneca vaccine available and possible um, in India and so forth. So there have been market victories in all of this, but it needs, a set, it needs coordination. It, this cannot be an ad hoc affair. And, and the, any cost benefit analysis would markedly suggest that it would be highly, highly important that we create a global prepared organization. Now, there are two questions here. One is who funds it? I don't think the funding is a problem. Um, we have plenty of money to go around. Um, the second question that you're asking is a very important question, which is how do we bring everyone to the table? And the person who, and the biggest absence at the table is China. Um, we need to find a mechanism by which we can persuade them to come to the table, whether it is carrot or stick, I don't know. Um, I'm not a political analyst, but all I can say is that had we known about um, the devastation that COVID could and would cause on the planet in December, 2019, two years ago, we would have taken a completely different set of actions. And the inability to know, and I would argue potentially the suppression of information um, made a big, big difference. Um, and we are suffering through all of this now with yet another variant. Um, where an infection could have been contained, I suspect at a local level, long before we had a multi-trillion dollar disruption of economies, loss of lives and loss of livelihoods. So I feel terrible to disrupt the conversation, but we have a number of uh, questions uh, from the audience. And with your permission, Dr. Mukherjee, Ayesha, Priya, Lawrence, maybe we could address some of the questions that, that, are, that have been posed.
posted in the Q and A function. Uh, so will you will, will you moderate that? Are you? I would be delighted to. So maybe we begin with the first question that that also brings up the question of reporting, and we've talked about the press and. Uh, Prabhakar Krishnamurti asks, it has been hypothesized that cases and deaths have been undercounted in India and Africa by as much as six to 10 times. Can you comment on that? Yeah, I, well, I have lots of comments on that. I, I, I spoke with um, several people before the Delta wave, but, um, but certainly through the Delta wave. Um, you know, the question of how to count deaths is always a complicated question. Uh, you think that it might be simple, but it's complicated. Um, the, in India, for instance, the weight, the official numbers are often mistaken or are biased and are, don't tell the truth. So we have to rely on so-called family surveys. And these family surveys then um, try to identify what the cause of death is. Now, before the Delta wave, I spoke with many people who were doing family surveys. And what was controversial and important during that phase was that many of the families, there was clearly excess death in India before the Delta wave. That excess death in India, interestingly, as uh, Dr. Cohen pointed out, did not track or did not seem to track the epidemiology of COVID-19. Now, you can make various assumptions about that, but it, there was clearly excess deaths, but it was not the kind of excess deaths that you would expect from COVID-19. Um, and the provocative hypothesis was that the, before Delta again, the provocative hypothesis there was that the disruption of life caused by migration, forced migration, forced lack of livelihood and forced lack of um, resources was responsible for those excess deaths. Then when Delta came to, the, to India, the uh, epidemiology changed and there were excess deaths in India because of Delta itself. So what we're seeing in India, at least, seems to be a composite or a combination of the pre-Delta excess deaths caused by, I would say, misallocation of policy and misallocation of resources, followed by a true medical crisis um, that followed uh, when Delta came. I spoke, it, this did, did not, I was asked by the respondent to remove this from my article in New Yorker. But when I wrote the article in New Yorker uh, on the pre-Delta wave in India, um, someone said to me, we turned a medical crisis into a social crisis. And then when Delta came, we turned a social crisis into a medical crisis. So India got hit, I would say twice slapped twice in the face. Um, first by a medical crisis that became a social crisis, migration, lost wages, lost nutrition, lost medical care, and then a medical crisis that became a social crisis, which is lack of uh, medical assistance, a uh, lack of um, appropriate supply chain concerns, inappropriate or inadequate centralized, federalized resources for poor people and so forth. So 
that double slap, I think, is a reminder that you need these both pieces, yin and yang, the medical and the social, to collaborate. And you can only have a successful response to a pandemic. And I would say a successful response to climate change, a successful response to chronic diseases, et cetera, et cetera, if these two collaborate. So um, the sad story is that um, both of these are became turned into crises when a preparedness system would hopefully have prevented that to happen. So if I might uh, turn the conversation slightly in a different direction and uh, raise a question that Kelly posted in terms of thinking about Twitter. And uh, she, Kelly asks, on these panels you propose, who, what is addressing the dis disinformation, especially through social media? So much effort being undermined, public health sector being attacked, think of WhatsApp University. Uh, do you see some uh, someone, some group that is actually making headway and creative effectively? So the role of social media in terms of the pandemic. Well, people are making headway. I, 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 you know, I think social media is a double-edged sword. Um, I think there are many people making headway. Um, my general policy about social media is to only subscribe to people that I really believe in. Um, and also to remind people who monitor social media to um, label misinformation as misinformation. So today I, I, um, I was very pleased, for instance, to note that um, there was a whole thread of anti-vaxxers going around saying that the cardiac toxicities of these vaccines were, uh, were enormous. First of all, they're not. They're a minor fraction. And the cardiac toxicity of COVID-19 itself is enormous. So um, I think obviously social media has an important role to play in all, in all of this. Um, what we've seen in, in, in India is interesting. In India, most people have accepted and been uh, and, and have not been resistant to vaccination. What I'm hearing in Africa or the African continent is that there is a mixed response to vaccination. And uh, that worries me. And I wonder to what extent that has been driven by social media versus innate or intrinsic um, concerns about vaccination in general. Um, but, but I think um, Twitter at least, and not Facebook, but Twitter at least has risen to the occasion and allowed um, users to label things as misinformation um, so that we, we can at least figure out what is real and, what, and what's not real. Uh, another question in terms of trying to think about um, herd immunity and the notion of herd immunity. Is the notion of herd immunity relevant uh, in terms of widespread vaccination? and what percentage of the population should be infected for it to achieve herd immunity? Yeah, so I mean, as I said, the next 10 days will be very crucial because we will figure out what vaccines do or don't do to Omicron. Um, they, I mean, in general, in the history of pandemics, it is not vaccination, but herd immunity that has, um, ultimately dampen a pandemic. This is true for the Spanish flu. 
it's true for polio, it's true for smallpox. We can imagine a utopian world in which vaccination would be the mechanism by which we could control a pandemic. I hope that's the case, um, but that's a utopian world. That world involves vaccinating up to four and a half billion, maybe five billion people before we can get a vaccination induced immunity. Um, the, as I said, the next 10 days will be very crucial because we'll find out what the case fatality rates of Omicron is. In, in, a, in, in an ideal world, the case fatality rate will have dropped or will be equal so that we can continue our vaccination efforts. Um, in a non-ideal world, it will be more infectious and more fatal. Um, I suspect that that's not going to be the case, just to give you a ray of optimism in all of this. Um, I suspect that the infectiousness is clearly high, but the lethality or the case, the case fatality rate is not going to be that high. I don't know. I don't have the numbers. That is just my suspicion from reading the early South African data. Um, if that's the case, then we are going to be, we are going to reach herd immunity quickly because the variant is spreading quickly. We may be reinfected, some of us, post-vaccination, but I suspect that if we are post-vaccinated, we'll be okay because the disease seems to be pretty mild post-vaccination. Um, so the conclusion really is get vaccinated if you can. If you cannot get vaccinated, you know, use, the you use your best judgment. Um, and if you are vulnerable, try to avoid getting infected by Omicron. Um, the as I said, the next 10 days are crucial because we, we don't have the data. And without the data, I'm totally unable to speak. I don't know. If uh, Priya, if you or Aisha have any more insight into this, but we, the entire world is looking for the case fatality rates by age for Omicron, and we don't have the answer because the South African population is relatively young. And um, we need to find out in older populations, um, 65 and above what the real case fatality rate is. What is very clear is that the infectious, the R0 of the virus or the infectiousness of the virus is very high, if not higher, substantially higher than even Delta. That may be good news or bad news depending on the case fatality rate. And I don't know, Priya, if you have any thoughts about that. No, that's exactly what I've been reading. Also, uh, everyone's waiting for the data. Everyone, so far, almost all the news is, seems like the cases are mild, and uh, but everyone's analyzing the sequences to try to understand um, if uh, the strain has more mutations and if it's more deleterious. So far, seems less deleterious, has many mutations, surprisingly. So uh, hopefully the news will continue being positive. Um, it is spreading though, uh, as, uh, Dr. Cohen pointed out there is the first case in San Francisco. I also read there was the first case in India a few days ago, uh, and there are many cases in Europe. So it is spreading quickly, uh, but hopefully vaccination will protect people um, and our vaccinated bubbles will protect everybody else around us. So yeah, and, and I have to say that India, after uh, the Delta wave has done a, an extraordinary uh, effort at vaccination. Um, the numbers are now up to a billion for the for one dose and up to 400 and something million for two doses. I, I have obviously, and no one has, I think, seen a vaccination campaign of this order. Vaccinating 1 billion people, 1.4 billion people over the course of six months is absolutely extraordinary. So um, 
much as I have some many reservations about the current government in India, um, I think that I uh, these vaccination efforts have been extraordinary. I, I should, do you want to comment or should we think of move on no, to another I, question? I, I completely agree. And all to say, I think vaccination is still our, our best hope. And the inequity in vaccination is, is I think, one of the biggest challenges in getting it to countries that, that don't have enough access. Yeah, and uh, let, let, let me also point out the idea that, you know, people have been asking Pfizer and Moderna to produce vaccines in India and et cetera. Uh, and we go back to the supply chain issues. These vaccines, Pfizer Moderna in particular, uh, were invented for the first world. Uh, they require minus 80 storage. Imagine a truck um, with minus 80 uh, storage, dry ice storage, leaving Bangalore where, or Pune, where the vaccine will be likely produced and going to Uttarakhand where the vaccine will be deployed. It's unimaginable to me. The ice would melt, the dry ice would melt, and whether you would have effective vaccine or not, we wouldn't know, right? So um, I'm not, this is not a, um, an excuse, but it is to say that the vaccines that are likely to be deployed in India and other places are AstraZeneca and Johnson Johnson, which don't require cold supply chain um, and will be likely to be deployed in those countries. Lawrence or Jihan? So we're almost out of time and I want to sort of go back to Dr. Mukherjee's last comment and trying to think about the political uh, system that made possible this massive uh, vaccine vaccination drive. And there are two questions which I'll take the liberty of combining from Shubhi Chaudhary and Anu Moitro. The Shubhi, Shubhi Chaudhary asks, your three task force ideal is excellent, but it, it is extremely important to have at least one person that is expert in process improvement. Otherwise, whatever processes through these task forces develop will have failures. Pandemic showed government of nations uh, impact process failure, create loss of lives. Could you please comment on this? And Anu also asks, talks about the political machinery of India, which has the, whether it has the will and transparency to initiate or even permit the autopsy that you speak of. So trying to think about the relationship between uh, the COVID pandemic and the political systems that that exist at this point? Well, so, so you know, when I, when I think about the three task forces, um, and I've been working, this, these are not pipe dreams. We've been working very effectively with various intergovernmental organizations to uh, put these task forces together. Um, so in other words, this is not just a dream that I have. I've been actively working with them. Um, there are now two of them, ex entirely, I would say, non-governmental. Um, but um, the idea of having someone who is a systems person or a systems manager um, is obviously of great interest. Um, there are lots of people who are, um, I would say, political um, aficionados or politically connected, but having a systems management person is very crucial here. This is uh, what allowed, ultimately, what allowed, I mean, again, I'm a, I'm a historian of medicine, I'm a historian of systems medicines. It's ultimately what allowed ACT UP during the AIDS crisis to, um, to be active, right? So ACT UP was not doctors. ACT UP was political organizers, systems organizers, aided by doctors who allowed a system um, to be deployed in the right direction. Uh, the United States lost 700,000 men, mostly men, some women, to AIDS. 
um, ACT UP went up in the 1980s, 1990s, but the core force of ACT UP to take a lesson from history was not doctors, was not um, politicians, but were uh, grassroots organizers. Uh, and they moved city to city, uh, locality to locality, and made a difference. So I absolutely think that, that systems organizers are going to be a crucial part of this. Um, the second question has to do with inter and intergovernmental systems um, and the extent to which we can uh, capitalize on these intra and intergovernmental systems. And again, I would say without bringing for a surveillance system, without bringing China to the table, uh, we are going to suffer. Um, now, virtually every year we have a influenza pandemic or an influenza endemic, um, which originates in various places. China is one of them. Um, China participates in that, in that surveillance system. And so we need to take, I think we need, again, a carrot and a stick approach. The carrot approach is, look, you know, you protect your population and you protect the world. The stick is, if you don't protect your population on your, and your world, we, will net, we are already so heavily globalized. Um, as I said, we are exporting and importing the wrong things and we are, exporting and importing the 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 we, we are we are um, we are in a in a dystopic phase of globalization or globalism and we need to get back to the utopic phase of globalism and without the participation of major nation states such as china we will never get to that point and so whatever political personal and diplomatic pressure that we can apply to China to, to be part of this global surveillance system um, would be, I think, of crucial importance. Uh, thank you, Sid. And we have a number of questions, but we are out of time. Uh, we will forward to all the questions that were not answered to the speaker, um, but as we draw to our conclusion of today's program, I invite uh, Shankar Bhattacharya, the founder of the Bhattacharya India Fund at UC Berkeley for some closing remarks. Wow, what a, what a lecture. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Shigato. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thanks for attending the fifth Bhattacharya lecture. This is the second year of virtual setting for this lecture. And I think we are becoming quite proficient given the efficiency of the evening today. As I understand, there are several hundred attendees of this lecture tonight. A large number of them are logged in from different parts of the world. All of your enthusiasm has been inspirational and I'm sure this evening's lecture did not disappoint you. Dr. Mukherjee, thank you very much for accommodating us in your busy schedule. What a wonderful perspective you have provided us on the future of India. In the previous year, as Raka mentioned, we had thought leaders that included economists, journalists, civic leaders, and historians. This evening, you have provided us a perspective of a physician, and it has no, it is a very enriching evening as far as we are concerned. Thank you again. I have a confession to make though. I had a special connection with your book, The Emperor of All Maladies. I read the book several years ago and watched the PBS documentary based on the book. 
Like many books, I thought the book was very informative and well-written. Until I read it again this summer following the passing of my wife, who we lost as a result of a very cruel and rare autoimmune disorder called anca associative vasculitis. I'm so sorry. This time, I was able to relate emotionally with the book, especially with some of the patients and their caregivers you have described, and the long journey of mankind to find the evolving cure for the cancer. As I read the book, I felt like I was reliving the experience. I'm also hopeful that like cancer, the cure for vasculitis will evolve as more people are diagnosed with that illness. As you were speaking tonight, I was thinking about how joyful you were as you shared the good news with Carla Reed that she was cancer free. Thank you very much for such a wonderful evening. I also wanna take the opportunity to thank Institute of South Asia Studies for their leadership in organizing this program. My special thanks go to Raka, Shugoto, Sonchita, Punita, and their team. Punita, thank you very much for finding Dr. Mukherjee for this year's lecture. As Raka mentioned, the Bharacharya India Fund is created to promote dialogue between world's oldest and the largest operating democracies. In view of the current state of democracies across the world, it's incumbent upon us to engage in constructive dialogues to learn from each other's experience. The Bharacharya India Fund creates a platform to promote such dialogue. And Dr. Mukherjee, your lecture tonight goes a long way towards meeting that goal. Thank you. Thank you all. Have a wonderful evening. Shugata, mic is yours. Thank you, Shankar. And my sincerest thanks to Dr. Mukherjee, Lawrence, Aisha and Priya for a wonderful and really thought-provoking conversation. I personally will be thinking more about the various conversation discussions that came up over the next few days. My thanks also to the audience from across the world for, for being, being with us here today. All our talks remain available as an archive of recordings. So should you wish to refer back to any part of today's conversation, use it in your classes, you, we think the, the debates that came up, the recordings can be accessed via the Institute for South Asia Studies website. My sincerest thanks. Good evening. Thank you very much. And it's an honor to be with you. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>